it's one o'clock on Tuesday, February the 15th. I'm your host, Pete McGuinness-Mark, and you are watching Science at SOST. This whole series is intended to showcase some of the exciting new research being conducted at the School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology at UH Manoa, that's SOST. And we bring in both graduate students as well as postdocs, young scientists to tell us something about their exciting new research. And I'm really pleased to say today we have Nad Nadia Mosuva who is an, from the Department of Atmospheric Sciences. Nadia is uh, a specialist in the physics of aerosol transport and atmospheric phenomena. And today we're going to be talking about a topic which is close to my heart, tracking volcanic fog. And if any of you live on Oahu or on the Big Island and have allergies, you will certainly know a lot about fog because it's not very pleasant. So Nadia, welcome. I apologize if I've uh, corrupted your last name. I would just call you Nadia. All good. Thank <laughs> Thanks you for very having much. me. Thank you very much for appearing on the show. Uh, and why don't you tell the audience a little bit, what do you do? Your speciality is atmospheric sciences, correct? That's correct. So I am a researcher with the um, VOG measurement and prediction program at UH Manoa. And I've joined about um, nine months ago. So not too long ago. Um, after completing my doctoral work in atmospheric science. Um, so I did that at the University of British Columbia in Canada. And my work now uh, focuses on uh, numerical and dispersion modeling uh, with kind of a, a broad goal of improving air quality prediction in Hawaii and providing model guidance for hazard mitigation. Okay, and, and uh, let's just back up a little bit. Maybe some of our viewers aren't familiar with the term fog. Um, can That's you a good one. <laughs> give us, give us a, a more general public description of what, what is fog? Right, it's, uh, so fog is a bit of a Hawaiian slang actually, because it's, so it's a combination word, kind of joining volcanic and smog, um, but mostly in, in other places around the world, uh, it's referred to as lace. Um, so it's this haze that you see, it's uh, in Hawaii, it's predominantly made up of um, sulfur dioxide and sulfate aerosols. Both of them are harmful pollutants and um, they affect visibility and they have impacts on human health. Uh, they have impacts on agriculture and vegetation. Uh, so they're not great. And so we try to model uh, how they move in the atmosphere and how downwind communities might be impacted and to what extent. And so then, you know, the state officials, um, the public, they can plan to protect themselves from fog and reduce the exposure. And so fog is directly associated with ongoing volcanic activity at Kilauea Volcano? That's correct. So Kilauea Volcano is pretty special in that it's been erupting near continuously for like four decades, so since 1983. And so it keeps putting out a substantial amount of emissions um, on a quite continuous basis. So you can think about it, if you take the dirtiest uh, producing plant in mainland US, um, it produces an order of magnitude more pollutants on a fairly regular basis. Um, and it does so for a very long period of time. And so that's why we typically get bog fairly regularly in Hawaii. And uh, obviously, people on the Big Island would suffer from fog more often than those of us here on Oahu. Um, is it island-wide? I suspect you'll tell us where some of the uh, the, the plumes will go. Um, but we only get fog here in Honolulu infrequently. Is that just due to the volcano shutting off or is it due to um, atmospheric air circulation? Yeah, so this is an excellent question. It's actually um, related to the predominant weather patterns that we get in Hawaii. So um, often we get what we call trade winds. Um, and so those are the winds that go sort of from the east to the west, um, actually from the northeast to the southwest mostly. Uh, and it relates to this high pressure system that um, sits just uh, to the north of Hawaii Islands and it's responsible for these trade winds. And so we get this pattern quite a lot. So often the fog just kind of blows out from Kilauea into the ocean. Some of it gets recirculated back 
uh, and we'll see that on some of the slides I'm going to show. Uh, but generally, things move left to right in the map, and most of it ends up over the ocean, and thankfully not over Oahu, where we have, you know, lots of people lots living of people. so most of our population yeah so a lot Lo more people lots of allergic people it. yes well True. for viewers watching on the mainland maybe they aren't familiar but i think your first slide will show just a little bit of the effects of this fog so michael if we could have the first slide uh, and t tell us nadia what what is it we're looking at it looks like two totally different localities Unfortunately not. So that's the Kona coast on, on the big island um, on a clear day uh, versus under rock conditions. And so uh, this happens quite regularly, unfortunately, when we have volcanic activity. And you would think that the Kona coast that's on the leeward side um, and it would be protected by, you know, the tall peaks we have in between the volcano, the, the Kilauea summit. Um, and the leeward side, but that's not the case because a lot of it gets recirculated back to the mainland. And so this haze that you see is actually um, so that's sulfur dioxide, SO2, and uh, sulfate aerosols. And they create that, not, so they don't only create those health impacts, they also have, as you can tell, visibility effects, so it impacts aviation. And when we have those trade wind conditions, um, we often get this strong inversion um, from the above, which sort of keeps a lid on them. So they keep getting mixed down to the surface. And so all of those pollutants are trapped near the surface where all the people live. And so it's a big problem. I was, I was gonna ask uh, at what altitude above sea level um, would that haze be? And you just said it can get trapped almost down at, at sea level. Yeah, so it's, uh, and again, some of those slides that I'm going to show will probably um, make this a bit uh, a bit easier to visualize, but uh, generally the layer closest to the surface, about a kilometer deep, we call it the boundary layer, uh, and within this is a mixing layer where things really get um, constantly mixed in during the day by ambient turbulence. And this layer is about a kilometer deep, um, and things generally get kind of uniformly mixed through the depth of this layer. And most of the volcanic emissions end up in this mixed boundary layer. And so whatever we get out of the volcano ends up getting well, well, well mixed through and dispersed down to the downwind communities. So that's well, not you've, great. You've, you've called for some of the other slides. So let's take a look at the second one, <laughs> sure. which I think will uh, show the viewers a little bit better what kind of dispersal pattern you're talking about. So if you have slide two, there we go. Sure, and I'll get a, give a bit of background on what the slide is actually showing because it's one of the um, products that we create. So. What we do at uh, Log Measurement and Prediction Program, or VMAP for short, uh, is we create these operational forecasts of um, air quality uh, so people can go and look and see if their community might be impacted if they need to take steps to protect themselves. So we have this online dashboard. It's user-friendly, it's mobile-friendly, um, and you can go every day and we update the forecast twice a day and you can see those, this is a sample image from October actually, because we had more VOG, but you would see the current most recent forecast extending 60 hours into the future. Um, so what we're looking at um, is, if you, if you actually look at just the gray shading on the map, so the fairly faint gray shading, that's the aerosol plume, um, sort of visualized as if you'd be looking down at it from an airplane. So if you peeked out an airplane and look straight down, this is what you would see. Um, the reason it's useful for us is because uh, this way we can know where the plume is and we can compare it with satellite data, but it's not necessarily useful from um, perspective of forecasting air quality because people don't live where the plume travels, they live at the surface. And so we really want to know what's happening at the surface and how high is the risk at the surface. So the colors that you see, which is kind of the orange, yellow, red, it shows the likelihood that a certain location on a map will experience poor air quality. So where you see more red, like if, you, if the location you're at is showing a lot of red in the next few hours, this is animated uh, on the website. Uh, you see that into the future, you're gonna have a lot of red. Would be a good idea to try and stay indoors, avoid strenuous activity and um, try to protect yourself from unnecessary exposure. Um, so we create these forecasts every day um, and this is a very typical pattern that we see. Uh, it does change based on ambient weather, of course, and the emission rates and, and all sorts of other conditions. But this unique pattern of things blowing from left to the right 
is very common. And you can see that as things get sort of emitted from that little volcano symbol um, on the big island, they get pushed a little bit around the tall peaks. So there's a bit of what we call island blocking. They go around the south point of the big island and then they get recirculated back towards the leeward coast. We call them the Kona Eddy. And unfortunately that brings aged plume and all of those pollutants right back to the people of Kona. And so it's, it's an unfortunate and a very persistent pattern um, in terms of air quality. And generally once that unfortunate step happens, things often go off to the ocean and then we're not as concerned about health impacts down there. Um, of course, this is what happens most of the time, but not all the time. Sometimes we get, you know, Kona winds and things get turns towards the other islands and then everybody gets impacted. Um, but this is a fairly usual picture that you would see. Okay, so, so these maps are generated every 12 hours. What kind of data do you use to run the model? Um, you know, is it atmospheric? Uh, is it uh, emission from Kilauea? Um, what kinds of measurements need to be collected in order to run your model? Yeah, so this is, you know, a, a good way to refer to it is not just a model, it's a modeling framework because it requires a combination of models and combination of data sets. Um, yeah. So kind of the most bulk chunks that we have in this framework is first of all, we use a you know, numerical weather prediction. So that's your meteorological weather forecasts um, that everybody's used to seeing. So we run our own weather model um, at UH Manoa and we take those forecasts and then we use them uh, in combination with uh, information about the source, the emission rates, uh, the vent behavior, the heat fluxes. We do plume rise modeling, and then we put it all together, and then we run a dispersion model using all of those kind of combined fields. And that's what gives us um, the forecast to make it even more exciting. This is not a deterministic forecast. It's not just a model we run once. Uh, you can think of running the framework many, many times. So we run it 27 times to be precise. And then we look at the likelihood that something will occur. So by running it many, many times, we get more confidence about our results. Uh, so we change things a little bit and see how much impact they have in the forecast. And that's why we can create those probabilistic forecasts you see on a map, which tell you how likely it is that you're gonna get log at a certain location. I see, okay. Uh, and um, I think the third slide would show a little bit about one of the uh, pro probabilistic models. Um, if we go to the third slide, uh, there's three different images here. Um, explain to us what we're looking at on the left-hand panel. That looks like you've got the volcano at the bottom and then all these ray paths are traced out. Is that your uh, probabilistic estimate of where they would go? Not quite. This focuses on that one component of the framework, the plume rise modeling. And I'm a bit biased here because that's what I like. I love learning about buoyant plumes and how they interact with turbulence. So this is the piece that I bring to the program um, where I can sort of use my background to help improve a piece of the framework. Um, so if, if you recall, I mentioned that we use numerical weather prediction and then we have all this information about the source conditions. And then we somehow take all of that information combined and then put it into dispersion model. And how we combine that information is very important. So I come from a background of wildfire smoke plume models. Um, and if you look at that left-hand side panel, it's actually a simulate, it's an, a simulation of an idealized wildfire, but it looks so awfully similar to the upper right-hand side image of Kilauea eruption that you can see that there's quite a bit of overlap. And the reason for that is because they're actually, so the, the heat fluxes and the buoyancy that they generate is actually quite comparable in magnitude between volcanoes and wildfires. It's the same scope of, same type of an event. It's a natural hazard. It's not a campfire. <laughs> campfire will not give you that plume. And you can see that it has a lot of interesting dynamical features, like it generates vortices that we see in volcanic plumes. It has this initial updraft that then disperses in a, in a thick layer. So there's quite a lot of overlap. Um, of course, there are differences, uh, and the difference are that the source is quite, it, doesn't look the same at all. Uh, so the right. source is, yep. I, I would imagine that you would say that the plume rise component is one of the more important aspects 
uh, of this whole endeavor. Um, let, let's just back up a bit. Um, the plumes which you're measuring, um, they aren't like the recent Tonga eruption where you had the big violent explosion that hurled ash many tens of kilometers into the atmosphere. This is, as you say, it's more similar to um, heat rising from a forest fire. The energy comes from the, the thermal uplift as opposed to simply being thrown into the air by the volcano. Right. So if you have, um, you know, jets forming kind of a violent eruption, that would add an extra component that generally doesn't occur in wildfires. But if you have, if you're looking at activity sort of like the most recent eruption um, and the previous eruption after that, uh, there is not a lot of initial, you know, forced convection that happens above the vent. A lot of it is free convection that's just generated by the heat. Um, that being said, the Tonga eruption, I mean, a lot of the plume modeling has very similar equation, underlying equations between mm. volcanoes and wildfires. Uh, it used to not be the case, and it's not because the volcano modeling was wrong, it's because the wildfires weren't, weren't catching on. They only really became a big thing recently. Um, but and, and so they were approached more like smokestacks before. But when people realize, you know, climate change, wildfires are going to keep happening, and big mega fires are happening, they're actually quite similar. Um, they also they can penetrate, you know, like going to the stratosphere. <laughs> Practically, we can see traces of them all the way up. You know, they can circulate the planet multiple times. So um, depending on the scale of events you're looking at, there are similarities uh, for the kind of eruptions we typically have. Um, they're a good proxy, but the source conditions are different. It's too bad you weren't here in uh, mid-2018 when there was a really big eruption down near Kapoho on Kilauea. I was in the field at the time and was seeing these great big thermals and there was even lightning storms and things like that, simply because the, the heat from the lava on the surface was creating its own weather patterns. But presumably your models could take care of that as well as uh, eruptions at the summit. Exactly. So essentially, when we have something with that amount of heat, um, it's not like the surrounding uh, surface, it will generate its own weather, uh, it will generate its own updraft. And the strength of that updraft really depends on the strength of the heat. So how much energy is going into the plume? So if that I think if, if we go back to slide three, you, you can talk a little bit about the, um, the heat coming off of uh, the lava lake at Hale Mau Mau, right? So, um, yeah. So the you know the nice thing why I really love modeling vog plumes is unlike fires, they don't run away from you. They don't move with the wind. Like the source doesn't run away. It doesn't succumb to fire suppression efforts. You don't have to worry about fuel types and soil moisture. So you can really get down to you know you can really constrain the problem, um, and it's very important because if you so. The reason why even study plume rise is because uh, you can think about it as uh, if you make an error of about say 10 meters, 200 meters, predicting that vertical rise, um, for downwind dispersion, that means errors of tens of hundreds of kilometers. And that's because often in the atmosphere, winds just don't blow in the same direction. So near the surface, they could blow in one direction, higher up, they can blow in another. And also different atmospheric layers behave differently. So the mixing is gonna be different. So that error has a lot of impact and so if you just improve this one piece of the modeling framework, you have a lot of potential to improving overall accuracy. And so when you have very well constrained source conditions and you have all these scientists from USGS, from HVO, setting up camp <laughs> essentially around the summit and measuring and observing all of this, and there's so much expertise and there's so much detail in the measurements, you can really focus on the problem you're trying to solve. Um, so it's much easier to model volcanic plumes because you have better input data for it. Okay. And, and USGS is, is uh, US Geological Survey. That's and correct. HBO is the Hawaiian Hawaiian Volcano, 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 Volcano Observatory. Yeah, okay. okay. So we collaborate with them a lot. Um, we rely a lot on their expertise on emission rates, on um, the behavior. So one of the things they do is they operate that thermal camera, which gives us that detailed image of the source conditions. So we can always see what the volcano is doing and adjust our model to reflect that. Now, I think you, you have techniques to sort of ground test some of the uh, plume height 
measurements. Uh, it, it, uh, you, you have on the fourth slide, um, I think you're making some measurements of uh, either uh, variations of optical density or aerosols. So if we go to the fourth slide, maybe you can uh, tell us a little bit what we're seeing. Um, the instruments presumably on the left hand side and then uh, an impressive color diagram on the right. Yes, so that's um, that's one of our kind of one of the directions we're taking is with instrumentation as well. Uh, so what we're trying to do is understand a little bit better of what is happening in the vertical and atmosphere. So how does this mixed layer where the pollutants are trapped, how does it change throughout the day? Um, how does it grow and how is it decreasing? So uh, we recently acquired this really cool new instrument. Uh, this is a LiDAR salometer. And we've set it up in Pahala. So you can see us setting it up with a lot of help from the Department of Health. Um, and it allows us to collect data every minute. So here I'm just showing a sample plot from one day. Uh, this is February 2nd, so fairly recent. And you can see the level of detail it provides us to us about the mixed layer growth. So we generally now can tell that, you know, it stayed below 1,000 meters on that day. We can see where the clouds are. So the blue scatter points are clouds at various levels. We know at very, which altitudes those clouds are. Uh, we can see how, you know, the thermal activity dies down for the night. So because this is an UTC time, the night is where all the blue is near the surface. So you can see that the winds change uh, and the backscatter intensity, which is what we're actually measuring, um, it decreases because the turbulence dies down. So the mixing regime changes at night. Uh, we can actually see precipitation. So if you look kind of near 3 a.m. UTC, you see a lot of red and that's uh, the lighter actually catching raindrops. Um, so it can tell us about precipitation events and all of that has um, a lot of implications for, uh, for actually figuring out both the physics and the chemistry of how bog behaves in atmosphere. So all of that has great potential to improve our forecasts. Um, the LIDAR, it's kind of like a laser and it's simply looking straight up. So you have like a point measurement. How did you decide to put the LIDAR at Pahala um, when the plume might be going <laughs> offshore or somewhere else? Or is it these data are better than no data at all? Or, or, or is this the best place to be? So this actually relates to, you know, to the sample forecast slide I've shown. We have the trade winds. And so most of the time we have a very consistent weather pattern. So Pahala gets hammered with VOG a lot because it's directly downwind um, under trade wind conditions. Um, and because, you know, because of the blocking that the topography creates, a lot of the VOG gets pushed to Pahala. So they experience a lot of the VOG events. And the Department of Health has their air quality monitoring station there, naturally. <laughs> um, so we actually wanted to co-locate uh, with the air quality monitoring station. So we set up the slaves are right where they're measuring surface SO2 con um, concentrations. And we can cross compare what's going on with vertical uh, with what's going on at the surface. So this was an easy choice because both yeah. we get a lot of VOG and we get measurements simultaneously. But do, do you get the LIDAR data in real time as well? So you can feed those measurements into your models or is it done retrospectively? Uh, so that's the long-term goal. So yeah, the, the idea is that we're going to be extracting mixed layer depth and mm -hmm. we're going to use that to actually nudge the um, numerical weather prediction forecasts that are driving the dispersion models to have a better representation of the depth of that layer. So when things get mixed in it, we're mixing it over the layer. That's the correct depth. Right. How, how big a deal is it you say the health department is uh, monitoring in Pahala? You, uh, um, I know you're an atmospheric scientist, but do you have any idea of the, uh, the health hazards associated with this fog? Yeah, so unfortunately it is an air pollutant and unfortunately it does cause distress, especially for sensitive individuals. So people with asthma, mm -hmm. uh, children, um, essentially it's a, it acidifies, when you inhale it, it acidifies your respiratory tract. So it's very irritating. Um, and not only that, so that's what sulfur dioxide does. And then when it converts to SO4 or sulfate aerosols, 
those are very, very small aerosols. Uh, so they can actually be inhaled very deep and they go all the way into your lungs and once again cause damage there. Um, they're also hygroscopic aerosols, so they tend to kind of react with water in the atmosphere. Uh, so when we have like a typical trade wind conditions, roughly 70% humidity, uh, you get a mixture so that, that mixes with water and it becomes like 30% sulfuric acid, which is battery acid um, and water. And so you're inhaling battery acid, as you can imagine, it's definitely not good for you. And so unfortunately we see like hospitalization spike um, during bog events. And similar to other pollution episodes, uh, they spike for all sorts of reasons. So it's not just people with respiratory issues coming in, it just makes everything worse. Um, yeah. So we definitely see that reflect in hospital admissions. Right. Um, I think in the, the final slide, you've got a few computer renditions of, of some of your plume predictions. Let's take a look at that, Nadia. Yeah, so that's another direction that VMAP is going in. Uh, we're kind of trying to step, stay on top of things in science. And uh, one of the kind of more recent trends that's been happening in numerical modeling, with the computers getting more powerful, is we're able to simulate things at a finer, finer scale. Um, so what I'm showing here is our preliminary work with large eddy simulations. So those are numerical models that run at super fine resolution. So they can actually resolve individual turbulent eddies, individual thermals. And it takes a lot of guesswork and modeling um, out of the equation. So we don't need to model things. We can explicitly resolve them using these simulations. Uh, there's a cost. It's uh, exceptionally computationally expensive. So it runs on high performance computing cluster. So you can see this one rendition of a plume evolving from you know just initial eruption from Kilauea summit. Um, it's about six hours long to reach that state on the bottom panel. Uh, this took about a day and a half to complete. So obviously it's not very useful as a forecast tool yet. Um, just because by the time you finish the simulation, the events you were trying to simulate already over. <laughs> Uh, but it is very useful to try and understand how things work in the atmosphere, what kind of mechanisms and feedbacks there are. Uh, and we can then improve our operational tools and make our forecasts more accurate and more timely. So, so that's Nadia, another direction I'm, we're taking. I'm afraid we're almost out of time, but it sounds as if this is a really useful endeavor that the atmospheric sciences department is doing and partnering with various other agencies, USGS, as well as the health department around uh, the big island. Um, I, I'm really sorry we've run out of time. Uh, I'd love to quiz you about uh, whether you've been to the volcano or whatever. Um, but let me just remind the viewers, you have been watching Science at SOST. I'm Pete mcginnis Mark, your uh, host, and my guest today has been Nadia Mosiva uh, from the Atmospheric Sciences Department. So Nadia, thank you again for being on the show. Fascinating and important work that you're doing, uh, as well as your colleagues at the university. So thank you again for coming on the show. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for watching. And we will have another exciting episode of some of the other research being conducted at the University of Hawaii, same time next week at one o'clock here on ThinkTech Hawaii. So goodbye for now. Mm -hmm.